Hi, my name is Toby Foster. I'm a senior product marketing manager within NXP's business line edge processing. It focuses on networking and industrial applications at the edge. I specifically look at high performance networking. I've been at NXP or one of its ancestors for about 20 years, which is nearly an eternity in the Silicon Valley. Today, I'll be talking about some of the benefits and challenges of edge processing. We'll take SD-WAN as a high growth concrete example. I'll discuss the ways that, that ARM's system ready initiative helps solve some of these problems and how NXP is participating in that process with our partners. Finally, I'll introduce a new device that is well suited for this type of application. Where processing occurs shifts over time. Roughly, you could say that there are three levels of processing, centralized in the data center, distributed at the end users, and processing in between. Processing was centralized starting back from the late, 19, from the late 50s with mainframes, mainly made by IBM. Several decades later, the bulk of the processing moved to the end user in the form of PCs, which outsold mainframes for the first time in 1984. Momentum moved back to the center with the rise of cloud computing, starting in the mid-2000s and really gaining speed at the start of last decade. Now, complicated tasks such as speech recognition recorded by a smart speaker are actually performed in the cloud. Until now, there hasn't been much processing between the center and the end user. The edge has been the home of routers and switches that provided bandwidth between the user and the cloud. But there are some good reasons to move the processing in the cloud closer to the user. For example, latency is better without incurring the time it takes to go back to the data center. This can enable distributed real-time control of, for instance, robots in a factory. Resiliency is better. These robots can still be controlled even if there is a connectivity outage to the data center. And there is better privacy with sensitive data remaining physically inside a plant. So the edge runs some of the same applications that would otherwise run in servers on the cloud, but put, putting servers at the edge is not the answer. Edge boxes can't afford the price or the cooling solution for a hot server device. The right devices here have a smart compromise between performance, power, and price. In NXP's case, this is facilitated by developing a family of devices that is tuned toward the networking connectivity, which is still a major component of what an edge device does. There are so many different types of edge processing applications. For example, building security. We've implemented systems with small processors connected to cameras doing facial recognition, which could be used to allow authorized personnel to enter an restricted area. Later, this demo was augmented for object recognition. This could be used for safety monitoring in a factory to detect, for instance, that employees on the floor were all wearing safety goggles. Fleet management is another. Rather than sim simply reporting a vehicle's position to the cloud to make driving decisions, those calculations are done locally, which should generate some feeling of relief given everyone's experience with internet dead zones on a commute. We've demonstrated this with a train of semi-trucks with the driver in the front and the following semis being controlled by local onboard processing. There are so many more. Shopping is an interesting one. Through facial recognition, personalized ads or recommendations could be provided. Amazon Go's cashierless shopping experience relies on this type of technology. Identifying what a shopper has put in the cart through object recognition and charging their on-file credit card for it as they walk out the door. The edge processing examples I've are the edge processing examples I've given so far because they are easier to visualize are mostly related to industrial use cases. But there are uses in networking applications as well, and SD-WAN or software defined wide area networking is one of the early ones with large growth prospects. It's used by small, medium, and branch businesses as a way to optimize their bandwidth costs while improving quality of time-sensitive data like voice. SD-WAN boxes 
may have several types of WAN interfaces connected to it and classifies packets via the OSI model to determine what type of application they are supporting. Latency sensitive traffic such as voice over IP, video conferencing, streaming could be directed to more expensive private WAN networks such as MPLS. But the bulk of the traffic like email and web page downloads can be routed over the much less expensive public internet using virtual private networks for security. SD-WAN secure traffic with IPv4 and IPv6 IPsec. One of the benefits of SD-WAN is that the hardware is based on commodity off-the-shelf white boxes, keeping hardware costs down. This approach can efficiently address linear performance requirements from a wide variety of enterprise and small medium enterprises. The functionality is defined by centralized orchestration. The orchestrator has a catalog of virtualized network functions that it can deploy to the branches and service chain them together. These are things like firewalls, virtual private networks, IPsec, deep packet inspection, virtual routers. It is obvious that this type of approach requires homogenous hardware, especially considering that the multiple boxes in play are not necessarily manufactured by the same vendor, nor are they based on silicon from a single company. It, is, it certainly rules out the ASIC approach, where a data path is defined in silicon to be very efficient, but it isn't flexible. It needs to be based upon general purpose processors running standard operating systems that all look identical from the orchestrator's perspective. But as bandwidth increase, especially the IPsec requirements can overwhelm a general purpose processor, devices suitable for this market typically have security offload engines built in, enabling a smaller, lower power and lower cost processor to meet the requirements. This hardware Offload must be transparent to the orchestrator and is typically implemented in such a way that the virtual network functions have virtualized access to the security engines. All of this requires a platform for the virtual ne vir virtualized network functions to be deployed to. This has been evolving over time. As recently as 10 years ago, there were multiple instruction sets over in play, including Power, MIPS, ARM, and x86. With too many options, the ecosystem was disjointed. It was hard to develop a software solution that was applicable to a wide range of hardware, and it led to vertical solutions where a single vendor provided a variety of complementary proprietary hardware and software that was internally compatible as long as you didn't introduce another vendor. Customers had little leverage in such case and thus solutions were expensive. By the middle of last decade, the industry had consolidated around two instruction sets, ARM and x86. While the x86 ecosystem is dominated by Intel, the ARM ecosystem has both the advantage and disadvantage of having many members in it. The advantage is that there is healthy competition between vendors, and that leads to more innovation, specialization, and optimization for certain use cases and lower costs. Additionally, the consolidation happened around the ARM v8 64-bit architecture, so binaries could run across silicon from all vendors. The DPDK application programming interface interface makes it possible to have a standard interface towards the hardware from a Linux user space application. So once you have Linux running, everything above it looks homogenous. But that leads to the downside of this vibrant ecosystem. Getting Linux running on an SOC could be a fairly vendor specific thing. NXP has been working toward this module, this model of a homogenous software platform for years. The foundation is NXP Silicon. We have a large range of ARM v8 64-bit processors, ranging from a single core, a single core A53 device to a 16-core A72 device. This represents about a 40x range in performance when considering core count frequency, core type, I/O connectivity, and security throughput. On top of this, 
is the bootloader and Linux software, including methods to ensure that the correct code is loaded to that device and that that code cannot be reverse engineered. On top of that is all the Linux utilities that SD-WAN software vendors expect to leverage. KVM for virtualization, VertIO and VFIO for virtualized access to IO, networking functions such as Open vSwitch for directing traffic to the correct virtual machine for processing. Many, X, many NXP devices have capabilities for accelerating this cycle intensive task. This approach has been successful as far as creating a homogenous platform across all NXP silicon is concerned. We have a single software development kit that supports all the ARM V8 devices in our portfolio. We upstream all of our Linux and UFI drivers so that they are available in kernel.org and distros that use that as a base will automatically support NXP silicon. But in reality, even that is not quite enough to coalesce the ecosystem. Despite support for standard bootloaders, there is still enough variance between silicon and software from vendors that it becomes a porting task for operating systems to work on each different vendor's silicon. This sets up a chicken and egg problem where the OS vendor would be willing to port if the business case was there, but it was hard for the business case to firm up enough without the correct OS support in the first place. So ARM stepped in to break this logjam with Project Cassini. It enables the Linux ecosystem vendors to easily work across many ARM platforms by virtue of creating some standards and testing regimes that ensure this homogeneity. It also has aspects to ensure security in the sense that you are confident that it has booted the correct code. But I'm going to focus on the standardization components of it. Project Cassini defines three levels to their system ready designation. SR for server ready enforces the most homogeneity as its purpose is to enable cloud workloads to be deployed on ARM-based servers in the data center. It is also the one of primary interest in the context of SD-WAN, where those same cloud workloads are pushed out to the edge. The other two tiers are ES for embedded server, which brings enterprise workloads to more diverse ARM hardware, and IR for IoT ready, which facilitates running community distros uh, on uh, IoT platforms, including 32-bit operation. NXP's effort is mainly in the server ready space. This describes NXP's process for achieving the server-ready designation. There is both a hardware and firmware component to it. In order to be compliant to a software standard, you have to start with hardware that can be compliant. SBSA, or Server Base System Architecture, defines a bunch of things that enable functions an OS may use to be invoked all in the same way. Level three compliance is for SOCs incorporating ARM V8 cores that NXP uses, such as the A53 and the A72. SPSA defines the features of the cores, of course, but it also defines other components in the SOC, such as characteristics of the memory map, clocks, timers, and watchdog functionality, how interrupts are assigned, management of power, uh, and manage and power management modes as well. NXP components are level three compliant, but there are also compliancy levels at four, five, and six, and they support new features of the more recent ARM V8 instruction sets. Above that is SBBR, or server base boot requirement. Building upon the assumption of SBSA compliance, it provides a standard firmware interface to the operating system. The lowest level of firmware is TFA, Trusted Firmware for ARM. This is the very first code that executes when an SOC comes out of reset, and it does low-level device configuration, such as setting up the memory controllers. 
using Opti, which levers the, leverages the ARM trust zone, TFA establishes a trusted execution environment while running the processor in secure mode. It then launches the UFI bootloader in non-secure mode of the processor. UFI, or the Unified Extensible Firmware Interface, describes the interface to the operating system while the device is booting. UFI doesn't prescribe any particular implementation, so we use an open source implementation of UFI from the Tiano Core community, which facilitates use through its EDK2, or Extensible Firmware Interface Development Kit. Finally, ACP is the last element of SBBR. The Advanced Configuration and Power Interface is an industry specification that allows operating systems to discover and configure a device's power management capabilities. It deals with things such as going into sleep mode, reducing clock speeds when the load is low, and disabling components on boards that aren't being used. UFI has to be in instrumented to support ACB by providing a list of capabilities in a specific format, and ACP in turn advertises that to the operating system. So those are the components that are necessary to make a lot of different SOCs look like a single SOC to the operating system. An SOC can be considered server ready if it does all these things. ARM rightly says that there is no specification without verification. So it has defined a suite of tests to prove that an SOC's implementations are correct. This is called the Architectural Compliance Suite. It validates SBSA at the hardware level and has many tests that cover various aspects of SBBR. SBBR is tested in, way, in, very, in some specific ways and in some more general ways. For instance, ACB is tested with the firmware test suite, FWTS, that has hundreds of subtests that look at things like if a power button or a sleep button are doing the right thing, and if control structures are configured properly. UFI is tested with a self-certification test that confirms correctness with many different types of tests, looking at, for instance, USB and networking operation. LUV, or Linux UFI validation, looks at UFI in a Linux context. Those are all things that are looking specifically at the bootloader features, but other types of tests look at the end goal that can an operating system boot on this board without any modifications to configuration parameters or making any changes to the operating system itself at the code level. While going through this process, we booted CentOS, Fedora, Ubuntu, and others. You must also be able to boot Windows. So far, we've booted Windows PE. This is a small operating system intended to help repair Windows 10, but it's the initial stage in the compliance suite. The only thing that NXP has to do to complete our server-ready compliance is boot full Linux, and that work is ongoing right now and expected to complete soon. This is the initial platform on which we conducted work in support of server-ready enablement. And in fact, this board is also going through IoT-ready enablement certification process. This board was developed by our partner Solid Run in Israel. The chip in the middle is NXP's LX2160A device, our 16A72 core communications processor. Solid Run put it on a ComExpress Type 7 module and then developed two different mini ITX carrier boards for it that bring out different I.O. The one that we did all this work on is a smaller of the two called Honeycomb LX2K, and it brings out a 10 gig port, 4 by 10 gig, 10 gig e port, uh, one 10 gig, one, one, one gig port, four 10 gig ports, a four and a by eight PCI Express slot, an M2 connector, among other things. Solid Run it, it, initial intention for the board was to get a low cost development workstation out to the ARM developer community, so they could develop for ARM on ARM. This platform is capable enough for development, compiling, running a normal desktop, testing, and also has a reasonable price that makes it quite accessible. 
The process towards achieving SR certification has been a group effort with teams from ARM, NXP, Solid Run, and also VMware participating. VMware's ESXi hypervisor is in some sense the customer of the server-ready endeavor, in that it is the thing that is supposed to just work when we attempt to boot it. So it was great to have VMware engaged very early in this process. They were taking drops long before the software was anywhere close to being server ready, and it was very helpful to work through issues with them as the customer. As a result of this and other work, VMware has introduced the concept of ESXi on ARM fling. A fling is VMware's term for essentially a technical preview of capabilities before it becomes a fully committed product. Its purpose is to solicit feedback on how customers may want to use it. VMware introduced four different ARM platforms to support this fling, of which one of which was Honeycomb. This will be described in more detail during a session by VMware on October 8th at 1010 Pacific time. One of the other platforms that ESXi on ARM Fling supports is the LS1046 Freeway Board. This work was done after work on Solid Run's Honeycomb Board. The learning from the Honeycomb was incorporated into the software running on this board. Everyone was pleased to find that in this case, there was very little effort needed to get ESXi running, which of course helped validate the whole concept of server ready. This board, called the Freeway, is developed by NXP. It's based on NXP's quad A72 device, the LS1046. We have so far been talking about that in order for the ARM ecosystem for SD-WAN to be successful, that the operating system needs to see a common SOC underneath it. But also implicit in the success of, ARM, of the ARM ecosystem is that there are appropriate ARM SOCs. Today, NXP is announcing a new member of the ARM V8 family of Layerscape communications processors. This one is called LX2162. It is a repackaging of the LX2160A, which with 16 cores is our highest performance SOC. The LX2162 retains those same 16 cores, but shoehorns all that capability into a package that is nearly one quarter the size of the 40 by 40 millimeter LX2160A. At 23 by 23 millimeters, it is also nearly the exact same size as the quarter coin. We are shipping samples of it now and will be in production in Q1 21. So here it is. Um, there's the LX2160, and the big one, and the small one is the LX2162 next to it. The size is very important for some of our customers who want to put a server's worth of processing into a PCB smaller than a business card. It is very well suited for space constrained form factors such as PCI cards, OCP3 mezzanine cards, ComExpress Type 7 modules, which are a little bit bigger than an index card, or some of the smaller ITX form factors such as Mini, Nano, Pico, or even the mobile ITX at 45 by 45, uh, 45 by 75 millimeter. So, just as Michelangelo took something bigger, a block of granite, and removed some of it to turn it into something better, his statue of David, so did we with the LX2162. In our case, we started with the bigger LX2160A. In order to fit it into its smaller package, we removed one of its two memory controllers and half of its 24 Surtees lanes and a few other things. Mainly, we wanted to focus on a device that had four 25 gigabit Ethernet ports and a BI-8 PCI Express port. This lends itself well towards the I.O. required for a network interface card in particular. In the case of network interface cards and many other applications, small size is of paramount importance. 
NICs that are larger than the half height, half length size increasingly cannot fit into the smaller servers that may house them. We chiseled off one of the memory controllers, but that is more than just excess material. The benchmarks to the right look at the impact of that. All of these benchmarks are relative to the 2160A. Those are the blue bars that has dual memory controllers. The benchmarks show what we would expect. For applications that are core centric, a second memory controller is not necessary and we see no difference in performance between the two devices. So that, for instance, is what we see with CoreMark, the CoreMark benchmark, which measures the efficiency of a core's execution pipeline and its L1 cache. Applications whose performance is set by the security engine also are not sensitive to the presence of the second memory controller. Next, we looked at LMBench, a benchmark focused on measuring the memory subsystem. The latency benchmark in this table is inverted to give a uniform bigger is better in this chart. And we found that a single memory controller actually results in improved latency. But it results in, as expected, lower bandwidth, which comes out at a little bit less than half of the dual DDR controller system. Most applications will depend on a mix of core performance and memory subsystem performance. So SPECINT is usually a good proxy for a typical realistic application. Here we saw that LX2162A achieves about 80% the performance of a dual memory controller system. This will probably be the typical experience of most of our customers. Okay, so in this section, we have talked about all the ingredients necessary to be successful in SD-WAN, one of the important segments of edge processing. SD-WAN is based upon the idea that workloads can migrate from the cloud to low cost edge boxes. In order for that to happen, we need to have the same enterprise class operating systems that host these virtualized network functions in the data center to also run on the diverse ARM silicon that will be seen at the edge. ARM has been facilitating making this a reality through the Cassini project, one aspect of which is the system ready, server ready certification process. This requires that an ARM V8 SOC and its software presents a common interface towards the operating system. This unifies the diverse set of ARM SOCs such that OS vendors don't need to port to each one of them. NXP is working with ARM, Solid Run, and VMware to achieve this certification on two devices initially, the LS1046A and LX2160A. And announced today is a new variant of the LX2160A called the LX2162A, which is much smaller and well-suited to the type of boxes that will be used for SD-WAN. Thank you.